in line with what we would like to discuss. And the question that we have this morning that I'd like to hear what your take is, is as follows. And we're asking, do you think that uh, the, uh, do you think that uh, the move to ban the media from uh, covering uh, certain stories is justified. Case in point is a, the case that is going on so far, uh, which uh, we are going to be referring to in just a bit. And I'd like to read some of your comments that have come through as you give us more of your comments. Do you think that the move to ban the media from covering certain stories is justified is the question. Matthew Ondoro says that no, the media is the only instrument of freedom in the whole world. Let it do every coverage, every time, everywhere, to everyone. I'll repeat that. Let it do every coverage, every time, everywhere, to everyone. Uh, we have uh, another um, comment that comes through, and this is Eric Miner who says, sometimes you are heartless, I believe, referring to the media. That's why the government sometimes acts like a class prefect in standard four classroom. Wow. All right, keep your comments coming. So far, we have 43% of you saying yes, it is justified, and 57% of you saying no, it is not justified. Do you think the move to ban the media freedom covering, uh, rather media uh, from covering certain stories is justified? That is the question that we have here this morning. I'd like us to start with the story that is uh, bringing us to this particular subject. And uh, shortly, I'm going to be reading the order that was given in court, uh, saying that we should not be covering some of the stories. But let's start, first of all, with the story that has been making headlines, and that is the story of uh, the murder of Tob Cohen. The lead counsel for the defendant, Philip Murgur, made an application to have Sarah Wairimu released on bail terms, saying she was being held without solid evidence. All this opportunity given, given to us. The application was rejected by the prosecution, who said Sarah was yet to take plea and a mental assessment report to determine whether she was fit to stand trial yet to be availed in court. Murgor expressed displeasure on the manner of media coverage Sarah Wairimu was receiving. Murgor said Sarah had already been prosecuted by investigators through the media. Justice Jesse Lesit then restricted media outlets from covering investigations into the death of the Dutch businessman Tob Cohen. On Friday last week, without involving her in the search or involving her counsel, there was a search, an alleged search that yielded the body of the deceased. What am I saying? There is no further reason to hold the subject. She got the star. And again, the media very helpfully are telling the world that Cohen gave sister 400 million villa in will. We don't know anything like that. We only know but Sarah Cohen is 50% owner of her matrimonial home. I have taken instructions and consulted the investigating officer. <coughs> we have no objection to Professor Andrew as she being accommodated because that's the best thing to do. This case and also the, process, the media is also prevented from publishing investigations into the matter. So I don't expect any address from me, either of the parties who are here. The defense also told the court that Sarah had a 50% ownership of the matrimonial property and was not aware of any will left behind by Cohen. Cohen's body was Friday found in a septic tank by investigators after he was reported missing on 20th July 2019. A post-mortem exam to determine cause of death will be undertaken Tuesday at 9 a.m. to accommodate a pathologist seconded by Murgur. Sarah Wairimu will remain in police custody until 26th of September 2019 when she is expected to take plea. Caroline B., KTN News. All right, and that is the entry point for the discussion that we're going to have this morning with the media there being accused of already having judged and victimized Sarah Wairimu. I'd like to read that order uh, before I throw it to you, um, Mr. Anio, as a lawyer, to just tell us, first of all, what you understand from this order. And the order is hereby ordered, number one, that the Director of Criminal Investigation, Prosecution, Defense, and Victim uh, to desist addressing the media 
on the investigation and evidence alleged to exist in this case. Number two, that the media also gagged from publishing details of investigations, evidence, or any other information touching on this case. Maybe just in layman's language, what does that mean? <clears throat> Thank you. Um, the order basically means that uh, the court is, uh, is saying that they assist of the matter, the murder case, mm -hmm. and therefore any reports about the murder should originate from the court, not outside the court. What that basically means is that uh, what the police are doing in terms of investigation or any, any evidence that they may have has to be subjected to court at one point or another. So if you then report about that evidence or the investigations, in a sense you'll be prejudicing the accused person. Mm -hmm. So the court is not saying that media should not cover anything about the murder of Coy. So that can continue, the coverage can continue? The coverage, as long as it's the coverage with respect to what is going on in court, mm -hmm. not what is going on, on outside, outside court. So a, a case in point and an example would be when Cohen's body was found uh, yes. or, or alleged to be found in the um, septic tank. Yes. Uh, coverage of that would be restricted given this order that has been given from now moving forward. Because that would be towards uh, evidence of the case. Yes, but there are two sides here for, from a journalist's point of view, for instance. You have a crime and you have a court case. Mm -hmm. There are two things. Mm -hmm. At the level when uh, the body was found, that was a news event. Something happened. So the media had to report on what happened. Mm. But now that the matter is in court, somebody has been taken to court, basically Sarah. The, mm -hmm. the manner in which you, we know it. Mm -hmm. Sarah is supposed to stand trial. So any other publications with respect to investigations that are being carried out by the police or reference to what the police would have in their files that they would use uh, to support their case against, uh, uh, against Sarah mm -hmm. has to wait for proceedings. I, I think our challenge usually is when are criminal proceedings active? because that's where the court is coming from. Right. That if the criminal proceedings are active, then you must allow the due process of court to take to, place. To, 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 to take place. All right, yes. let me uh, come to you, Eric Odur. Is that your understanding of the order? Is that what basically it means, that we can continue with coverage, but anything that would allude to evidence regarding that particular case then should come from the court and not from any other source? Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, I believe that uh, what is happening is uh, like um, people are abusing the court process and uh, if you look at uh, what's happening, actually the lawyers who have taken this matter to court so that they're able to control the narrative out there. And why, I, I'm, why am I saying so? Because how are you going to execute that order? Because uh, the courts have always given us orders, uh, gag orders, but now execution becomes a problem. Mm because uh, people want to abuse the court process. Because how will they enforce the order? Because the media, as it is right now, is diverse. You will not stop people from uh, speculating and writing these other issues on social media. Social media is part of the media. Mm -hmm. So I believe <clears throat> that uh, we need to find a way how we are going to respect the court process so that we don't abuse it. Mm -hmm. Because basically, I've seen the gag orders being given by the courts, but now the execution becomes a problem. And I think it's something that actually the judges should be looking at because uh, as I speak, uh, I engage the services of a legal consultant. Just look at some of these orders. And it has come to our realization that these orders are given by courts based on falsehoods and uh, people who abuse the court process. Then it becomes a problem when it comes to enforcement. To enforcement. Yes. All right. So in this particular case, when, <clears throat> when these uh, orders have been given this way, where does the line? Where, where do we draw the line? There's no way. There's no way we draw the line because, like I said, that when these orders are being given, uh, mm -hmm. and these judges and magistrates when they are giving these orders, they do not take into consideration how they are going to enforce the orders. Because, for example, I'll tell you, for example, there will be a gag order against the Standard Media Group, which is very specific about the Standard Media Group. 
Then when it comes to enforcement, they want to enforce you as Mike, as an individual. Mm. When your name does not appear anywhere Anyone. in the proceedings. Mm. So if that's what I'm saying okay. that these orders, sometimes they are given. Mm. But when it comes to enforcement, mm. it becomes a challenge. Okay. Because judges don't take this into consideration. All right, Dr. Anio, who's yeah. responsible for that enforcement? Because courts give an order, but they're normally enforcement officers, depending on what it is. If it's a criminal case, mm -hmm. you'd have the police maybe who are going to be enforcers of that. How is this enforced? Um, a court order ideally should be obeyed by all of us. If we believe that we are a country that uh, uh, respects by the, law. the rule of law, then we should, it, it's really on us, all of us, to abide by the law, including the media, whether social or mainstream. Um, but um, if, if we assume that uh, you can uh, break those laws and get away with it, I think it is uh, taking our luck, stretching our luck too far. Mm -hmm. The courts have power to punish for contempt. Right. Contempt of court, basically disregarding a court order, mm. if they really desire to do that. And uh, in the case of uh, media that is identifiable, for instance, uh, it is very easy to deal with whoever is involved. Mm. For example, if, if the order is, is given to media, and my understanding is that uh, the judge is basically thinking about media that they can easily identify. And that may be what they call legacy media or legacy media. media. Yes. Mm. So, so if, for example, any of the, the employees of that particular media house goes against the order, then they would cite... The employee plus the media house. Plus the media house for okay. contempt. And oh. they can punish them for and contempt. And punish them. All right, uh, Eric, do you understand or are you in agreement with the rationale behind the courts issuing this kind of an order? I'm not in agreement. That's what I'm saying. The problem there becomes because orders are supposed to be specific that you obtain orders or you or a, a judge gives a, an order or a judge or a magistrate gives an order against a specific person you once you've given a blanket order mm -hmm. that the media is bad from uh, covering this matter or, or um, who is the, this media talking about mm -hmm. it has to be specific that we are restraining mike from commenting on this particular order on, on this particular issue if you obtain orders against an employer, it doesn't have, that order is against the employer. It's not against the employee. So in the event that this order is violated, you go for the employer. So, you don't so go is, for the your, specific... is your issue the fact that the order should be issued to specific media yes, houses? Yes, the order should be specific. ABCD. Yes, the order should be specific to the media house and specific people. Mm -hmm. So that the event, for example, in the event that the order has been issued against standard, standard uh, PLC, for example, it has to be against the standard. In the event that you want to enforce that order or that order is violated, who do you hold to account? You hold the person who is in charge of the standard media group, mm -hmm. not you as an, as an employee of standard group. You see, that's what but I'm you saying. see, as an employee of standard group, the assumption is that I am under, I exactly. am employed, I am under the policy and uh, the rules, regulations, and whatever policy that comes exactly. with standard group you, 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 The order was against the employer who is the standard group. So that means they go for the person who, who bears the greatest responsibility or someone who holds brief for the organization. But then, that, Eric, that, that would mean that I, as a journalist, can be careless uh, because I'm covered by whatever uh, media house that you know, is covering me uh, on the pretext that it's not me who's going to be charged. That's what I'm saying that now we, there's a very dangerous trend that is actually is now developing. Mm -hmm. That in, we do not now want to hold organizations accountable, but we want to hold individuals, individuals. accountable. That's what I'm saying. If the orders are against a company, and actually that's the ad advice that I got from the uh, lawyers who, are, who have just been uh, analyzing these orders. Orders are against companies, not, not journalists. So if you want to enforce an order, because if uh, an order has been given, for example, like I'm still, still using the standard group because we're here, who is served? Are you served as an individual or they serve, they serve the company? They serve the company, not yes. you as an individual. Mm -hmm. So that means if this, order is, if, if, if this order is supposed to be enforced, they are supposed to enforce this order against the, um, the company, not you as a journalist. Mm -hmm. But we've seen a trend whereby when they want to enforce orders, uh, or they go, the orders the they go for specific journalists. Mm. But when they are serving, they don't serve specific journalists, they serve the company. <laughs> All right, because uh, that's, 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 that's where the contention is. All right, and we are going to challenge that so that we are able to get a proper interpretation of how these orders are supposed to be enforced. Because right now what is going on, these processes are being abused.
Okay. Dr. Anio, mm -hmm. help us uh, demystify that bit because yes. my understanding is that even if an order was issued to a company, whichever company, employees under that company, should they breach that order, could also be charged. Thank you, Mike. And I think uh, I must say that you, you, you are right. Uh, I, I'm trying to appreciate what uh, the Secretary General is trying to say. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, ordinarily, when you talk about the Standard Media Group, we know it is a, it's a company right? that has employees. It has employees, and the company cannot operate on its own. There must be human faces to it. Now, these human faces are the ones that take responsibility for whatever happens in that media house. The order that has been issued by Justice uh, Jesse Lesit mm -hmm. uh, is basically to the media in the context of how they are publishing evidence mm -hmm. and investigations are going on. In the, uh, I mean, following the death of Cohen. Mm -hmm. So if an order is given directly that, please, there should not be these publications, because the publications will have to come from media anyway, even if there are human beings involved. It will be this media that, uh, that would uh, help circulate this information or provide the platform. Mm -hmm. So the, the order, once it is issued to the Standard Media Group, and I, I don't understand how it would have been issued, for example, against everyone else, specifically, like say, the order is against Mike, because Mike is the one perhaps who has filed an earlier story, or who is likely to file future stories, and so on and so on. I don't know how that then will look would like. Would work out, yeah. yeah. Eric, how, how would that be? Are you, are you saying, are you trying to say that it should be to specific people, for example, journalist A, um, anchor B, uh, you know, definitely, editor that's, C? Definitely, that's what I'm talking about, because so that we ab avoid uh, abusing the process and the court processes. Because okay. that's what is happening right now. Because you go there and you get a blanket order which you want to enforce and uh, restrain every individual against doing so, then you narrow down to individual journalists who have got nothing to do with us uh, proceedings. Like I was telling you, when you go to court, because I, I'm basing my argument on a particular case that actually there is also a gag order against uh, a specific media house. Mm -hmm. But now, when that order uh, apparently was not obeyed, then you now start narrowing down on a sp specific journalist, avoiding to go for the media house. Because the media, the, the gag order and even the proceedings, the preliminary, preliminary proceedings and the pleadings were against an entity, which is a media house. But now when you want to enforce this uh, order, you want now start to narrow them down on individuals. So that's what I'm saying is that when the, if, for us to avoid abusing the process, judges should now go down and demand when somebody is going to seek these orders, mm -hmm. that judges should demand that if you are seeking this order, you are seeking these orders to restrain who? So that these processes are not abused, because what is right now, you go and you get a blanket order, then you want to enforce it on everybody. On everyone. Uh, exactly. That's, that's what I'm talking about. Okay. Yeah. All right. And uh, maybe we'll move on from that a little bit. But let me come back to you, Dr. Anio, and your the question that I'd asked uh, uh, Eric as well, in terms of whether you understand or agree with the rationale uh, of Justice Lesit on behalf of uh, the courts issuing that kind of an order by virtue of the fact that sometimes cases could be jeopardized by what is printed on the media. Thank you, Mike. And um, uh, the starting point, I think, is our constitution. If you look at Articles 47 and 50, which basically talk about fair trial and fair administrative practices, uh, and uh, the general principle of uh, presumption of inno innocence, that we are all innocent until proven guilty, mm. I will then understand where, uh, from. Uh, where the judge was coming from. The judge is basically saying that uh, there is a matter that has been brought to court, and we are a country that believes that uh, where there are conflicts or where there are crimes that have been committed, it is the court that is competent to make a decision on whether the person before them is guilty or not. Now, if we decide on our own to conduct a, a parallel trial, then at the end of the day, uh, it does not guarantee the other person a fair trial. Mm. Because as we speak today, if you look at how we have so far covered uh, the case of Cohen, mm. you, you will notice that even after an arrest was made, which in my view is uh, the starting point of a criminal proceedings, mm -hmm. an arrest has been made, a, ch a charge or an information has been taken to court, even if the accused person has not pleaded. 
So we are basically talking about criminal proceedings that are active. Now, if you, we have this business now of, of trying to say, for example, to show that the prosecutor, for instance, has a very strong case against the accused person outside the courtroom, then what do you expect that would happen in the courts? Our judges, like everybody else, read, read the newspapers, mm. they go to social sites, they watch television, they do all manner of things. How would you expect this person to have you know, a uh, diluted mind when they make a decision? When there's all that splashed in the all media? All this is all okay. over. But, and uh, you but don't Mike, know Mike, which Mike, side. Mike, Mike, this is what I'd say. Mm. There are two schools of thought uh, about this matter. There are those who believe that um, judges are independent to make a decision, regardless of what people say, because there is no way a judge will control the thinking and the opinion of people out there. So there is a, a school of thought who believe, that believes that uh, once the matter is in court, is the, in, the, the competence of the judge that will help that judge to make a decision, regardless of people say out there. Then with another school of thought that believes that once the matter is in court, then the judge should be the one who is controlling the narrative, mm -hmm. which I, I, I don't agree with. I agree with the first one that we have competent judges. Right. And therefore, judges cannot purport that their decision is going to be influenced with what is happening outside the court. Outside the because court. The, those, the judges who said, because these are an argument we've had with judges, and the judges who say that first, for us, a case is determined and our decision is based on everything that is adduced in court Correct. and how lawyers argue their cases. Mm -hmm. Therefore, our, when a decision is made, is a decision is made based on what has been argued in court, not what has been argued outside. And that right there, Eric, becomes now the challenge for the courts. And I'll tell you why. And I've engaged Justice Lesit on this previously because it's not the first time that this is happening. And the challenge that she presented is whereby for instance, if uh, let's just take an example where DNA samples maybe had been sent to whatever place and came back, and then when they, came, they come back, the media is put before the gallery and these DNA samples as evidence apparently are brought in. But this DNA evidence does not get to court. Now, the judge is left with what, they, what is presented in court. They can only make decisions based on what is brought to court. Yes. However... In the media, there has been all this information about DNA tests that have been done and they have come out positive and all that. But now the judge, that doesn't make it to court. But on the public gallery, it was there. So now that becomes a challenge for the judge because how do they make a judgment based on the evidence that was presented to the people by media it, it, and what is in court? You see, that's what I'm saying. Actually, to me, it is an advantage to that judge so that we are able to trace where the problem is. And I can tell you for free, you, see, uh, you, you remember, I think a week ago, when a DPP decided to charge a magistrate in Mombasa mm -hmm. about uh, exhibits that, that, that actually that disappeared. So if this case we are talking about that the DNA results have not been presented to court, a judge is able to make a decision based on what was presented in court. Then the public is now out, out there, should now ask, where did the DNA results go? Then you are able to trace. Other than saying that we are not able to cover this, because once you cover, you, you don't cover it at the media, you also try to do cover up out there. Cover so up. that means that even when you have what the president in court, you're not able to trace where the problem is. Mm. So to me, it's an advantage to judge, because the judge will be able to have that my hands are clean. Mm. I made a decision based on the evidence and the information that was pre presented in court. Then now makes us now as the media and other authority to ask. Where did the DNA results disappear to? Okay. Mike, you uh, may say something yes, on that. Yes, I knew. Uh, I agree with the Secretary General that we are professional judges mm. who make decisions based on the evidence that has been presented before them and by applying the law to the facts mm. that have been presented. That is true. But uh, ideally, that is the ideal situation. You may say you are professional, you are not affected by what goes around you, but I think, uh, in my view, that's foolhardy even if as much as we want to say they are professional. Now, the other side of, of what uh, he's saying is that the courts want to control, and he doesn't agree with them, but the law gives them the mandate to control their proceedings. The same law that we have all voted for, we have agreed to be governed by, gives the mandate to control what is going on. Mm. And basically, that's where uh, Justice Lesit was coming from. Mm. This is my court. I have a case here. I must take care of everyone who is before me, 
I will not want anyone to be prejudiced by what is going on. That, that is true, but yeah. where do we draw then the line? And if we can talk about drawing the line when it yes. comes to courts, because again, we cannot assume or uh, negate the fact that sometimes they use that yes. uh, to gag the media and ensure that maybe a different object, because we are supposed to be a free media, yeah, we are supposed to report and, and follow, but at what point do we now say, okay, this is now crossing the line and they are gagging us from reporting or doing what we are supposed to do? Yeah, and uh, the, an the quick answer to that is this. In journalistic practice, uh, at least I have the advantage also of having practiced journalism. In journalistic pra practice, we have two bits here, crime bit and court bit. In our training, we are told what should I mean what comprises the crime bit. What kind of things could you report when a crime has been committed? Then we also know what should be covered when the matter is in court, which is basically the, the court bit. Now, we are, in our argument, we seem to be mixing the two bits. As we speak today, the matter is in court. Therefore, it's a court matter. What exactly are we supposed to do as journalists when a matter is in court? We report what, that which goes on in courts. All the evidence that we have so far splashed is actually evidence that will be presented in court. All or we have done... presented in court? Already, if it is with the prosecution, mm -hmm. then it means it would be presented in court. Mm -hmm. It would be presented in court. But we have already jumped the gun because we have already published this. I even uh, sometimes wonder when the, the case finally takes off and they start relying on the same evidence that we have already splashed. What kind of stories are we going to... To, 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 to give at that point in time. Uh, yeah. But d does that <laughs> stop us really from putting that evidence? Because really for us it's a story. For us, no. it's the, the evidence is still part of the story. Remember, those are allegations of fact. Whatever we call evidence are allegations of fact. Until they're presented. They before. have not been tested. That is why when you are accused of a crime, even when the prosecution is putting their best foot forward, mm. you have a chance to poke holes into the evidence that they have. Mm. So basically what we are calling evidence is what, according to it's the a... prosecution, adds up. But it has not been subjected to any test. For example, people need to cross-examine the witnesses. People need to ask questions about the same evidence. But the manner in which we are presenting it, it's like it's a foregone so conclusion. So should we self-gag? Are you saying then we should self-regulate and self-gag ourselves? Actually, in our training, mm. that is exactly what we are supposed to do when we, sh we clearly show a demarcation that this is a crime report and the other is a court report. Nobody comes to tell you us. See, it's see, our training. You see, Mike, right now we are still uh, <laughs> dealing with the issue of uh, a crime reporting, like he's saying, because uh, the case actually has not taken off. We've not seen the charges against Wairimo. The Wairimo has not taken plea. So right now, investigations are still going on. And that's what actually what the media is doing. Once Wairimu takes a plea, which is most likely to happen, I think, sometime next week, and the matter is that she's properly charged where the charges are read out and we know these are the charges against Wairimu, then you can tell her the matter is completely, the court has the completely seized court. over the matter. But at the, wrong, at the moment, we are still in uh, crime reporting. Right. Exactly. What happened? And that's why I was saying that some of these orders, when people are looking for them, and uh, I'm sure these are uh, orders that are just being sought by lawyers so that they're able to control the narrative before the matter is brought in court. Mm. So to me, those orders actually, first, actually is denying uh, the public their access to information, which is also in the Constitution, is also trying to restrain us from freedom of expression, as uh, stipulated in Article 33 of, of the Constitution and Article 35 of the Constitution about access to information. The public, actually, this is a matter, if you look at the way it has elicited a lot of uh, debate and uh, excitement and uh, at the same time also the, the, the issues surrounding this, the public wants to know what actually happened as investigations go on. Once the matter is actually, the, uh, the lady is uh, charged in court, the charges are very clear that Wairimu is, has been charged of A, B, C, D, the matter has started in court, she has taken plea, and now the case has, uh, has begun. And you know, from there, now you can say this is a matter that is already already in court. Mm. But at the moment, right now, 
uh, this year is still carrying out investigation, and that's why they are sharing the information with okay. the media. That, that is true, Eric, yeah, but don't you agree to some extent with Andy the fact that these judges are also human? They're also operating in the same environment we are operating, such that we could jeopardize the case depending on how many things or what we splash on the media as supposed evidence, because it has not been put through the test. Yeah, that's, that's what I'm telling you, that uh, when judges are also trying to issue these orders, sometimes they issue orders that becomes a problem when it comes to enforcement. There is no way a judge will want to control a public debate. A court cannot control a public debate. And what's right now happening now is a public debate. People are debating what happened and uh, trying to find out what could also have happened. So yeah, to me, I think it's wrong for a judge to sit in a court of law and you think that in this age and era, you in 21st century, <laughs> you are going to control how people think, mm -hmm. how people behave, mm -hmm. and opinion that people hold out there. Because this is all, actually, this is also in, a, in, our, in our constitution mm -hmm. that every member of the society has got a right to hold an opinion. Mm -hmm. So people actually, what people are discussing right now is opinion that people have in regard to this matter. So therefore, even if the illicit issues orders, there is no way how these orders are going to control how people debate, how people hold opinion about this matter. So I'm saying that these orders are given, yes, but there are orders that when you look at it, you seek critically and start analyzing these orders, you realize that these are orders that cannot be enforced. Mm. Maybe you'll be able to gag nation and standard and star and people to, to, from carrying the story, but in the social media, the debates are all are there 24 hours. And that's still media. Yes. Yeah, right. that's media. media. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Just on. a slight clarification on the position of the law. We are talking about uh, the matter not being in court, and I don't agree with the Secretary General, uh, because uh, court... What are the charges against Wairimu? Has she been charged? Court, for, for me, me, I mean, the criminal proceedings, um, which are court matters, begin at the level of either arrest without a warrant or arrest with a warrant. The moment the court issues an order, either allowing the arrest of someone or someone is arrested and an information, because what is actually in court is what we call an information, not a charge sheet. The information has been filed because this is a capital offense. Once the information has, has been filed, already that tells you that these are active criminal proceedings. You can't pretend for one moment that the matter is not in court. Otherwise, Justice Elizabeth will not have issued the order. Mm. Because then what will be the mandate? Where will she be coming from? Yeah, you know, you see, that's what I was saying, that actually you are the one who talked about the ideal and the real situation. Yes. You are talking of an ideal situation. <laughs> but in a, in a real situation, <laughs> that's not, not true, because you, you are just reading the law as it is. But to me, I'm trying to read the law and also try how this law is and, applicable. And, and, and gentlemen, the question mm. then There's would be, at what point do we, because, I mean, journalists are not uh, per se lawyers. There are some lawyers like him who's a journalist, but there is also the space for responsibility, responsible reporting, where we have a conscience, we have rules and regulations within uh, our space that should dictate how we treat such cases. Because at the end of the day, we also don't want to jeopardize the case. Yeah, yes, yes. I, I know that, first of all, our Bible is the truth. Nothing but the truth. Correct. Was then the body found in a septic tank? You see, there's no way you lie to the public that the body was not found in a septic tank. The body was found in a septic tank. The, the journalists were there. They took the pictures. So there is no way you'll stop the journalists from telling the, the public. Somebody that they, might argue and say the body was removed from the septic exactly, tank. Exactly. Yeah, don't know how it got there. Yeah, exactly. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> and and it the has media, not been tested that it was actually put there after the murder. That's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. That, and the media issues. did not say so. Mm. The media say that the body was removed from a septic tank. How the body go to the septic tank, that's a different story. Mm -hmm. You know, that's what, those are the narrative you cannot actually <laughs> control. But, but Mike, yeah. even, even, even if you, you put law aside mm. and you, you deal with our own code of ethics in terms of accurate reporting, fair reporting. Yes. That is now KUJ. Yes. What does it say about accurate and fair reporting? Accurate here refers to the, both accurate in terms of content and in terms of context. Now we have a situation where the matter is in court. Do we pretend for one moment that the matter is not, not in court? Because then that will not be accurate reporting. Mm. If we want to play up one side and downplay the other, does that amount to fair reporting? If we want to, to make the court look like the, they are operating without mandate and the media is the one with mandate, are we then reporting accurately and fairly? 
That is all about he, ethics. He, you know, no, no, that's what I'm talking about. <laughs> huh? What I'm saying is this. There's, yes. a court, there's a process that actually is taking place in court. And the media has fairly reported about what has had taken place in court. Then there's a new development. A body was found and removed from a septic, a septic tank. tank. And the media reported so. And the media went ahead to quote DCI and the investigators actually what was happening. So that is actually was happening. That, that, that is a fact. That is okay. Yeah, so but, to me, I'll, I'll be worried mm. if media probably said that the body was found probably in a, in a thicket or in a forest somewhere. But the media just actually is accurately repeated as it is. As it is. Mm -hmm. And there is no way we can control that because that is the truth. And, and the I, media, agree, I agree with and you. And the media is supposed to stick to the truth. Mm -hmm. If the body was found at, uh, in, a, in a septic tank, uh, because I, I don't think if the media said who killed Cohen. I don't think the media oh, said so. The media just haven't. said. We haven't. We haven't said. Yeah. The, the media just so said. <laughs> yeah, the media just said. The body was found and removed from a septic tank. How it got there, even the media has not even said how it got there. Mm. So we have to respect that. The media actually just stated the facts as they are. Interpretation is different because the media did not interpret that. The media just said the body was found and removed from a septic tank. The rest is people now who are interpreting, coming up it's with up the different interpretations. And I agree with you mm. that uh, that was a news happening. That's yeah. an event. Mm. It was a reporting. It's crime reporting. Yes, yeah. crime reporting. And the court did not gag that. But the details of how the body got there and or who was at the position and so on mm -hmm. is about evidence now coming from the prosecution file, mm. but now coming from given, the investigator's given. report. Uh, remember, Mike, before I, I lose it, the story that I read in the standard about that incident was very clear that the DCI himself said he would not provide the details because the matter was in court. Correct. Just read the story. Yes. It's very clear. Mm. So that the media gave us that which was given by the DCI. Uh, the DCI. Mm. And what was the media enjoying in that context? It was enjoying what we call ex executive privilege. Getting information from government as government. That we cover and nobody would stop us from covering it mm. because that is a right that we But now given the order, yes. the DCI has been uh, gagged from giving any information? In terms of details, because if there are details, remember finding a body, the body was missing. So finding it is a news event. Mm. It's something that will report. See, but see, Mike, but now, if you go to the details, mm. Mike, for example, this, Mike, which witnesses, yes, Mike, moment, Mike, this is what I said. That even these orders are supposed to be issued, also they are supposed to be in line with the law. What does Article 35 of the Constitution say? It says that the public has a right to information that is being held by the government. This year is an agency of the government. So that means that the public have got a right to find out the information that is being held by this year. This is a right that is given by Article 35 of the Constitution. Mm. And therefore, the, the judge cannot purport to, to bar the public from, from enjoying the right that has been given by the Constitution. That's what I'm talking about. I don't, that's a right that is given I, I, I by the Constitution. I don't disagree you, you, with you. You cannot take it away I, I by a court order. I don't disagree with you, mm. but you also believe in the rule of law. The yes. same Constitution you are quoting, mm. there is a process in which we try crimes. Once the process has begun, then we, we allow those who the we have charged to, to with the responsibility to take charge. Is, is That's that, basically is, my is, point. Is, 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 I agree with your point. Yes. And I think uh, there is, this is a discussion we've had with WB, the CJ, and even with the judges. And I think the dilemma that judges are having right now is also trying to comply with the new constitution of 2010. Because you are still getting orders that probably judges who are still giving orders, they are giving these orders with the background of the former constitution, not bearing in mind that right now, and actually there's a judge who confessed. The judge who confessed that sometimes we give orders, and actually their nightmare right now is that sometimes they give orders and make decisions based on laws that actually have been repealed. That is a confession that was made by a judge. Okay. So that's what I'm saying that right now, even some of these orders, if you deny the public the right to information as given by the Constitution, and it's very specific, Article 35 of the Constitution, that says the public has a right to get information, information. that is being held by the government. All right. So when, are, so when we are getting these, these orders also, the judges must also be bear in their mind that there sometimes these orders are also violating the Constitution, Article 35 of the Constitution, of the right to information, mm -hmm. and also the right for freedom of expression. 
All right, so moving forward, and I see time is fast spent, we'll need to uh, soon wind up. Um, Anio, where does that leave us? And not just to do with this case, yes. but even with any case that is before the court. And this uh, court orders might be issued again and again, because as journalists, we have to, one, be uh, uh, abide by the law, mm -hmm. but secondly, we cannot allow um, uh, you know, uh, instruments of the law to be used against what we are supposed to do as, as you know, um, um, uh, gatekeepers of the law. Thank you, Mike. <clears throat> One thing that I think I want to, to, to probably express here is that most rights that we have, including Article 35 uh, that is making reference to, they are not absolute rights. They have limitations. Mm -hmm. Even the orders that are given by courts, you would realize like the order that uh, now is an issue, the one that we've been discussing by Jazil Sit, is not a blanket order. There was no order gagging the media from publishing anything and everything about Cohen. The order was specific. It was only targeting investigations. Mm -hmm. Don't report on investigations because the matter is in court. Mm -hmm. But report anything else that is not investigations. Mm -hmm. Just to allow due process. And I, I don't find it uh, a very unusual order. These orders have been given in, even in cases where, for example, they are involving children, or where if, if you expose a child, for example, so much, you'll be harming the child mm -hmm. instead of helping the child. Mm -hmm. All right, so a court I, will give an order mm -hmm. limiting you on how much you can say a particular, about a particular but, but case. But now, let me just pose you there, uh, yeah. because, because of time. Yeah. Uh, the second uh, point in that order yes. says that media is also gagged from publishing details of investigations, evidence or uh, uh, details of investigations, which is fine, yes. uh, evidence or any other information touching on this case. Now, what is any other information touching on this case? Now, anything that is not before court, remember the court is now seized of the matter. Whatever we are seeing here are just procedural issues, for example, you, are, you have not been assessed to the mental test to assess whether the person is fit to stand trial and so on. Mm. So any other information that you may get which would speak to the merits or demerits of the case before court is information that you should not publish. This is information that should be given to uh, the, the police, for instance, who will then in turn present it before court. Mm. So, so ideally what they are saying is that don't engage in other issues that appear like you are also uh, you know, running another Another, another, an, another investigation or another mm -hmm. trial. Mm -hmm. Just publish that which uh, does not prejudice any of the parties that are before court. So if that, there is that, information that is useful, give it to the relevant people. Mm -hmm. So that is left now to the conscience of the media houses, or media, let me say, yes. uh, to determine what that is. But at the risk yes. of uh, going against the court order, which of course has very punitive measures, I agree with you, but where would the media, for example, what kind of information are you likely to publish if it has not been tested? If you find someone here, for example, coming to your media house and telling you, you know what, I can tell you exactly what happened at Cohen's home, mm. then they give you a whole version. Would you run it? No, that would not You run. wouldn't. Yeah. Is, Ideally, is, you would refer this is, person is, to take it to the police. Is, okay. My, my point is... Huh? Yes that compliance with the court orders does not necessarily mean that we cannot interrogate the orders. Exactly what we are saying, yes, the media will comply, but we have to interrogate those orders and challenge them. That that is these okay. are orders that are being given, yes, you've given, but it's a blanket order. Mm. It's a, an order that, first of all, also uh, contravenes sections of the law, mm. and that is our position as KUJ that yes, the judges have given these orders, because I know in the recent past, I think there are two orders that have been given against the media. Yes, the orders were given, the media will comply, yes. But does not, does not stop us from, from interrogating, interrogating these orders and challenging them. And that's why I'm saying that orders have been given, mm. but as KUJ, we are challenging them. In we are court, saying I hope. Exactly, yeah, we are, we are going in to challenge them, them in, in court, court, yes. In court. But also in public <laughs> opinion, you can't stop us, like I say, you can't stop her from me, mm. you can't stop me from holding my opinion against these orders. Mm. And my opinion against these orders at first, these are orders that are also violating sections of the law. Number two, these are orders that are actually just given to please the lawyers who are in, 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 in court here to protect their clients. Because if you look at the way the matter has been prosecuted out there, actually uh, they have been prosecuted by the lawyers 
from both sides mm -hmm. who are also trying to protect their interests and their businesses because lawyers are in business, not necessarily in the public interest. Mm -hmm. These lawyers actually, when they act, they don't act in the public interest. They act in the interest of their businesses. Of their because, business. Exactly. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, Ani, I'll give you the chance to have your closing remarks. I think for Eric, that will mm -hmm. probably serve as your closing yes. remarks because yes. we uh, will obey the orders, but does not stop us from interrogating them. Your closing remarks. Thank you, Mike. I, I think for, for me, uh, what I would say is that uh, as, as, as practitioners and journalists, we should always be aware that ignorance of the law is not a defense. Mm. We should purpose to find out what the law is and see how we can use it to our advantage mm. so that we don't appear like uh, we are fighting you know, the law Yet that law is for is that for everyone. Does it benefits say. everyone, the journalists and every and the parties or the subjects that we write about. Mm. All right, thank you very much, gentlemen. We'll have to wind it up right there. That's Eric Odour, Secretary General for KUJ, and Dr. Anyo Nyaboga, who is a communications lecturer and a lawyer as well. So the debate continues online. And remember, the question that we're asking is whether you're in agreement or you feel that the orders that have been given to gag the media in this particular case are justified. There are those of you that feel that, yes, they may be justified. There are others that feel that they are not justified. So far, 40% of you say yes they are justified and 60% of you say no, they are not justified. Keep your comments coming. We'll read them towards the end of the show. And if possible, also let us know why you think yes or why you think no. But for now, we're going to take a short break. But do stay with us right here on Morning Express. Today's Wednesday. We've got your health lined up, but also we've got the docket coming up where we'll update you on some of the proceedings and things that we're going to be following up right here on KTA News. But for now, let's take that break.